Welcome to this special Who, What, Why Forum. I'm your host, Jeff Sheckman. It's been 22 years since Bush v. Gore, and we're still waiting for the results, not of the election outcome, but whether we have an appropriate infrastructure for democracy. We have been told repeatedly that our most recent national election of 2020 was the most secure, honest, and accurate election ever. As we might have expected, we've had partisan pendulum swings back and forth. We had Bush reelected in 2004, Obama in 2008 and 2012, Trump in 2016, and Biden in 2020. On the surface, it appears that everyone is getting a fair shot, that the system works. But does it? Amidst all the noise and dust that Trump has thrown up, have we just wanted to argue that the system works in response to that noise as a way of shutting up, stop the steal? Have we reached a point where elections that may be rigged are not challenged and that elections that are challenged are often not rigged? We have over 3,000 counties in the U.S., each with its own system of elections, each using machines from a limited number of vendors who have lobbied and made promises in order to get those county contracts. It's a system that, like the Wizard of Oz, hides behind the curtain and may not actually be what it seems. In an age of digital voting and digital reading of even paper ballots, there really is no way to know if the announced results of any given election faithfully express the intent of the voters. This is not only because digitized voting machines can be hacked or manipulated, but often these modern-day ballots are not even available as public documents, even after the election. It seems that at the very least, we need to follow Ronald Reagan's advice, trust, but verify. Or as Stalin so correctly said, it's not who votes that counts, it's who counts the votes. This is the subject of this Who, What, Why special forum, and joining me for it is Jonathan Simon. Jonathan is a senior editor at Who, What, Why, a former executive director of the Election Defense Alliance, and a longtime expert on election procedures, and the author of the seminal work on the subject, Code Red, Computerized Election Theft and the New American Century. And we're also joined by Lynn Bernstein. Lynn is the founder of Transparent Elections North Carolina. She's a trained international election observer, a member of the National Voting Rights Task Force. She's trained as an aerospace engineer in understanding and integrating complex systems like elections. She's worked tirelessly to bring more fairness to the election process in North Carolina. Jonathan, Lynn, thank you both so much for being with us today. Thank you, Jeff. I want to start, first of all, with a little further background on the two of you. A lot of people have said in, in the run-up to this that people don't really care enough about this issue, that it's not a sexy enough issue for, for voters, given all the other noise that's out there today. I want to start first with you, Jonathan, how you came to this briefly, how you came to the subject of election integrity and, and voting machines as, as something that you were going to devote so much of your life to. Well, it, it began with Bush v. Gore, um, who was down at the Supreme Court on the, when that was argued, um, saw what happened, saw how the electoral system, uh, some of its flaws were manifest. Um, and then in 2002, sort of building on the debacle that was particularly in Florida, the hanging chads and whatnot, the Congress in its uh, infinite wisdom passed the Help America Vote Act. Uh, which hastened along the uh, computerization of the elections. They've been using computers for quite some time, but this brought in a particular kind of computer um, with various incentives, uh, carrots and sticks. It brought in uh, the direct re recording electronic computer, the DRE or touchscreen. Uh, and now you really, really had no idea. You had no paper record. You had nothing uh, to uh, verify these, these vote counts. And in 2002, there were some results that were shocking. Uh, one was in Georgia, the, the defeat of Max Cleland, uh, who was way well ahead in the polls and then you know, lost by a good margin. And there was absolutely no way of checking it. And the exit polls that year were so far off that they were withheld from the public. They were spiked by the networks. So that sort of piqued my interest. And then when 2004 came around, uh, I was advocating early, early on for some sort of uh, burglar alarm system, some sort of, whether it was exit poll based or what, um, to uh, help with the verification process uh, and make sure that things like, you know, 2002 didn't, didn't happen again. 
And then lo and behold, uh, it, it happened again, and it happened again in a big way in 2004 in Ohio, which was uh, very controversial, not unlike 2020 with Stop the Steal. And I was the person who uh, basically, uh, I didn't have a screen capture tool, so I actually printed out uh, several hundred pages worth of exit poll data and analyzed them and basically had a back of the envelope calculation by four in the morning that this pattern was very anomalous. Um, and if that sounds familiar, you know, this, this predated Stop the Steal by 18 years. Uh, but, you know, it's a system that sort of begs to be questioned because it doesn't provide uh, solid evidence um, and solid data. And so there I was with this, and it turned out that nobody else had it. I thought hundreds of thousands of people would have been doing the same thing, and they didn't. And so, so I had this data, and that became sort of the, the basis for challenging that election. And then it kind of hooks you in, as I think Lynn will probably testify that you get into this. And no, it's not sexy on the surface, uh, but boy, it's, it's very, very um, compelling once you, once you get involved. Lynn? Yeah, so um, I sort of came at this from a similar point, uh, although I did come on the scene a lot later. So I, I got into this um, for better or for worse <laughs> back in two th just after the 2016 election. Um, there were people who were wondering about our elections. You know, people did see what happened in Florida and they did see the system really change to electronic voting. And so People had doubts. People already had doubts in 2016. Um, it wasn't necessarily the same people who have, uh, who we're seeing who have a lot of doubts right now. Um, and so, I, I, so some people approached me and they said, hey, you used to do electro uh, testing of, of systems. And we want to know, could you look into whether or not these election systems that we have, whether or not they were tested properly, whether or not they were really, truly tested. And I remember being very arrogant <laughs> and saying, oh, come on, this is America. Our elections are fine. And so I spent a couple of weeks really digging in and doing research. One of the first things I found was Code Red. And I, I was just blown away by that. And so then I started going and getting documentation from the, the EAC, um, the Election Assistance Commission, and looking into the test labs that test these systems. And so I, I, I really read everything that I possibly could. It wasn't a lot. There, the, these test documents and these test reports, um, what they're calling a test report is really a test summary. There's no real data in there. And so I don't know for sure if these machines are actually tested at the federal level uh, properly. And so it's a bit of a rabbit hole. But once you start seeing things, you really can't unsee them. And so I really was actually looking forward to going back to school. I was going to go to grad school. Um, and I really wanted to hand this off to somebody else in North Carolina because I really didn't want to deal with it, but I knew it needed to get done. So I reached out to local organizations, the League of Women Voters, and they were not interested in it. And it's not something that people really want to dig into. One of the reasons I think organizations shy away from doing this kind of work is because it's really hard to quantify uh, how successful you are. So if you're an organization and you're trying to get out the vote or improve voting in some way, and you, you can go at the end of the day and show some numbers and say, look, we increased voting in this community by you know, 20% because we did this you know, initiative. There's really not, um, there's not a lot to quantify other than what I would argue would be uh, confidence, people's confidence. Because I really just don't think elections can be considered successful if people don't have confidence. And so that's sort of the number that I look at about whether or not, you know, we're, we're where we need to be. And based on the level of confidence people have in this country, we are very far from where we need to be. And to that point, Jonathan, it seems that the more 
people like you and Lynn do the work that you do and uncover the things that you uncover, the more we kill confidence that people might have in the electoral process, discourage voting, and really discourage them from even looking deeper into the process, that it is sort of a self-defeating process, the more successful people like you and Lynn might be. I don't think we have to worry about that too much because we weren't very successful, at least for, for many years. Um, and of course, we heard that argument all the time, and it, whether it was articulated or just sort of implicit, um, certainly from the the sort of guardians of the of the system, the poobahs, uh, we don't want to undermine voter confidence. And that was a, it was a it's a serious argument, and it's a and it was a big problem um, because in trying to reform a system that has these kind of vulnerabilities, you want to point out the vulnerabilities. That's certainly important. Although again, it it does make at least some people question whether their vote will be counted. Um, and if you're questioning whether your vote's going to be counted, it's a very small, not even a leap, just a, just a nudge over to whether anybody's votes are going to be counted correctly. But where, where it got very, very hairy for people um, in, in my field, which is election forensics, is when we came forward with evidence or data that suggested that those vulnerabilities had been exploited, that there was actual theft going on. Uh, you know, in the in the pitch dark of cyberspace, things were going bump in the night. And that's when we really would get shut down. Uh, and I could understand that because I can see what the potential is, what you can do uh, with a little conspiracy theory and a little little fear mongering. Um, you you really can undermine the system. So it's really posed a, a tremendous quandary for people that want to do conscientious and objective investigation of this of this process. Lynn, has this all been made worse, piggybacking on what Jonathan was saying, by how close elections are today? There was a point when somebody would win, somebody would lose by larger numbers than we see today. The country and states and communities were not as equally divided. And so the, the rules of kind of big numbers came into play. And even with a little cheating here, a little cheating there, the results weren't fundamentally different. You know, I, I think the closeness of the the counts, the closeness of how, you know, pe people say you really want wide wide margins and so i think it's less about the wide margin and more about just that we we have an election on pretty much every year and so there's really never a good time to reform the election system and so you know people are throwing ideas out there and like jonathan said you know when there are issues we can't ignore them i mean it's very dangerous to yell fire in a theater but it's very irresponsible to not say anything when you see smoke coming from the theater. And so, you know, when you when you go to elections officials and you say, hey, I'm seeing some smoke, they say, oh, gosh, we can't we can't. It's too close. We can't deal with this right now. And the media thinks it's too close to report anything because they don't want to scare people. And so. You know, I, I just feel like we're in this cycle and it has been this way for a long time where we we sort of patch up our elections going from year to year rather than really saying starting from a, you know, an engineering perspective and saying, what does a well designed election look like, what are the what are the requirements for this election, we want elections that are transparent and trackable and publicly verified and we want to be able to verify our vote before we cast it. And the election uh, machine vendors, you know, their systems don't necessarily even meet those standards. And so I, I feel like the bigger problem is how close elections are to one another and how um, hesitant elections officials are to changing anything. Jonathan, you wanted to comment on that? I have a little different take on, you know, the closeness. Um, and I think what Lynn said is, is absolutely valid. I mean, my take on that um, would be that what's really changed, elections have always been close. I mean, Kennedy Nixon was close and, you know, Bush v. Gore was close. And what's really changed is not necessarily the closeness of elections, uh, but the view of what is at stake in elections. That has changed. You know, Karl Rove, uh, who I think is a seminal figure in all of this uh, more recent development and how we've gone down this road, 
um, really spoke about a perpetual Republican majority, uh, perpetual rule, et cetera, et cetera. Wasn't that fantasy, though, on his part? Wasn't that just talking politics? I mean, the fact is, as I, as I talked about in the tr- introduction, we have had that pendulum swinging over the past 30 years. We have. And, you know, and, and up until uh, Donald Trump, I would say that in spite of Karl Rove's, you know, wish wishful thinking, if you want to call it that, or or his 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 wool gathering, uh, that the pendulum did continue to swing, but forensically the pendulum, and it's hard to see this on the surface, but if you dig down a little bit, the pendulum started to swing kind of instead of swinging from here to here, it sort of swung from here to here. And it got sort of pulled off um, and veered, and our country veered with it. Stay on this for a moment. I mean, we had the the Reagan Bush period. We had eight years of Bill Clinton. We had George W. Bush. We had Obama. We had Trump. We have Biden. I mean, the pendulum has been swinging. Yeah, and during all that that swinging, uh, progr- you know, we had Reaganism, and we had quote unquote compassionate conservatism. But if you remember, you know, Bill Clinton triangulated, and Barack Obama was basically a political eunuch from almost the get go. Um, so it appears to swing. You get these parties that, yes, win elections and lose elections, um, but the the national direction has taken a veer. And then when Trump came along, um, it really became what I would say is existential, because the idea was that if they win, whichever they is, uh, they're going to destroy us and we'll never see the light of day again. And at that point, elections have to be held to a much, much higher standard because fundamentally, once it becomes existential, once it becomes political total war like that, you really have to persuade the losers that they've lost and not necessarily beyond just a reasonable doubt, but as we've seen with Stop the Steal, beyond an unreasonable doubt. And that places a much, much higher burden on the electoral process, which it has failed to meet. But isn't all of that simply reflective of the country growing more towards the middle? And don't forget, Donald Trump did lose. Yes, but, you know, 40 million people, however many, I lost count, but however many of them would not agree with you. And, you know, uh, we we basically need those people uh, to, to, uh, we may disagree with them, but we need them to be a a well-functioning, a healthy body politic. But look at the political environment we're in. You have hundreds now of candidates who are on the ballot for November who deny that Trump lost. And uh, this is, you know, become sort of a a mission and a, a jihad of sorts. But aren't those political questions as opposed to questions about the conduct of the election? I want to come back to Lynn. How do we begin thinking about trying to design a system that is the most efficient and and is the most functional, as you were talking about? How does one do that in in a framework where there are 3,000 plus separate systems? I think you just have to start with just straight up common sense. Right. I mean, you talked at the beginning about how vendors um, peddle these systems. And, you know, we see we saw a lot of this in North Carolina where vendors would come in, they would have lobbyists, they would tell elections officials information about the machines that just were flat out not true. And if they had given it more than five minutes of thought, they would have known it wasn't true. And so, you know, that brings into some question you know, what is their motivation for doing that? But then, you know, by the time you know it, you have elections officials at the county level, um, you know, saying things like, oh, it's more expensive to use hand-marked paper ballots than it would be to have every person cast their vote on an electronic machine, you know, fill out their ballot on the electronic machine. Counting is a different process, but filling out your ballot. And so, you know, we went to these counties on the ground and we said, wait a second, why are you picking these ballot marking devices for everyone when a piece of paper and a pen really is all you need? And and they said, well, because we're sort of switching from all electronic voting to something that has a paper record. And um, they said, well, where are we going to store all that paper? And I said, well, you're going to have to store the paper and the machines now. And they just sort of looked at me you know, with deer in the headlights, like they had never thought of that before because they're getting this information from the state 
that in some cases is actually misleading, uh, misleading people. Talk about the vendors, Jonathan, without getting too deep into it, that there are really a limited number of vendors that are providing these machines, all of these machines, the, the ballot marking devices, the machines that count the paper ballots, the optical scanning machines, et cetera. Yeah, not only are there a limited number, but most of them, uh, all but one, as far as I know, are privately held. So there's very little um, record keeping accountability that, that you'd normally have with a publicly held corporation. So there's a lot of secrecy. Of course, they have, you know, pretty glistening websites that tell you, you know, how wonderful <laughs> their equipment is. Um, but it, it's it started post Help America Vote Act 2002. Uh, the the two big uh, eight hundred pound gorillas were uh, Diebold, and then you had ES and S, and they were counting about oh eighty or so percent of the vote. So it it it's a very decentralized system that's almost monopolistic when it comes to equipment. And you know if you think about military contracting, there's a hell of a lot of palm greasing. Um, you know you, you you get these contracts, you promise the moon, you do what whatever is necessary to get these contracts. And there isn't a lot of um, scrutiny or pushback from the vast majority of election officials. There are a few exceptions out there uh, that were, were notable for pushing back. Um, and But the exception kind of proves the rule. The vast majority sort of go along with it. And the other thing is that the, the most election administrators just do not have the technical chops uh, to really handle the technical maintenance aspects, reprogramming, all the all the things that have to be done with these machines. So they have a, a tremendous reliance on the vendors um, to get the job done, without which their elections would be uh, disasters. So that kind of dependency uh, breeds a great deal of cooperation and willingness to, to look the other way. And as I said, you know, they're, they're just a few main vendors, and then you have a bunch of satellites, which the public knows even less about. Further up up the um, stream from that, though, is, you know, when I was looking into these uh, voting machine vendor test labs, there's conflicts of interest among that as well, right? So you have the EAC, and they require that you get these machines tested from a, um, a voluntary Tell us what EAC is lab. for people. What's that? that? Tell us what EAC is for people. Oh, EAC. Um, the EAC is the Election Assistance Commission. Okay. And so, you know, you have these test labs. Well, there's only two certified test labs. And the vendors pay the test labs to test their equipment. So, and these and these test labs, half of their business comes from election uh, vendors. So you have, so if I'm I'm a test lab, half of my business comes from election vendors. They get to choose between me or somebody else to test their equipment. If I don't pass them and I'm really rigorous and, and I scrutinize their system really well, they're gonna go to the other guy. So the system is, the, the, the bones of the system are actually set up already to fail. How do we make the leap though, from palms being greased and all of this like defense contracting going on in this voting arena to being concerned about fraud and vendors actually having a hand in outcomes? So, you know, so I, I guess I would look at it this way. So um, I'll give you an example. In, in college, I took uh, an electrical engineering class and our final exam was a black box test. Essentially, they put some input into that box. We don't know what's in the black box. And then you get to test the stuff that comes out of the box and you need to figure out what's in the box we're never gonna know what's in those black boxes for those election systems, right? What we need to know is the people who voted, are they all eligible to vote? Did they only vote once? And then on the other end of it, let's let's count the ballots. But you know, the method that people use to, to fill in their ballots and, and counting ballots, you know, that, that's a black box. We don't even know who owns these, um, the election vendors, you know, we don't even really know who, who owns these companies. And so I kind of look at it like a, a black box and instead of trying to figure out what's, what, what is inside the box, which we'll never do, you really have to make sure that you're doing robust audits, that you're doing chain of custody audits, that you're looking at the election like a linked chain where each link um, is its own process. 
So, you know, you've got the process of registering voters. You have the process of checking in voters. You have the process of printing ballots. Well, how many ballots got printed? How many ballots are left at the end? I mean, all of these things um, are what should be done in an audit and they aren't being done. And I think I think part of the frustration for me is that, you know, I see elections officials standing there and saying, trust us, we audited everything. But I think what people assume is that they're doing some sort of independent and external audit, right? In every industry, there are external audits that are independent. And those give confidence, right? Um, you know, we can't assume that elections, that this industry doesn't have fraud. I mean, I think of, of any industry, this has the most, um, it's most logical for people to want to uh, have their candidate win. And so you, you kind of have to, to look at it from that. But, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't give me confidence when people who are running an election audit a few internal things and then say, trust me, we audited. Of course, you're going to give yourself a good grade. Why wouldn't you? I mean, I think if people looked at audits from across each little jurisdiction, right, we've decentralized these elections, what percentage of them are coming out perfect? Because that is a big red flag for me that I'm seeing jurisdiction after jurisdiction saying, nope, we got everything perfect. And that just really doesn't happen. I mean, maybe Jonathan can figure out the, um, the likelihood of that happening, but it's not likely based on the experience that I have had. And Jonathan, is the, the barrier to these kinds of audits and the kind of ideal things that Lynn is talking about, is the barrier money? Is it partisan resistance? What are the reasons that there's pushback to doing things in the way that Lynn is talking about? Part of it, uh, Jeff, I think is inertia. Um, you know, just like with any infrastructure, roads and bridges, um, you know, you, they've been laid down over a period of time and uh, it's difficult to make real, you know, more than incremental small changes. Uh, it's difficult to overhaul an entire system. And especially as Lynn said, given that elections are kind of cyclical and you just don't have 10 years to sit back and say, how are we going to design a system? I mean, it's funny. I was a, I was very early on, I think it was in 2002, there was a whole um, gathering of experts at, um, at in, in Boston. They were working really hard to come up with the perfect, you know, uh, election system that, uh, you know, with encryption and all this kind of stuff and internet and everything. And, you know, they might be able to, this is 2002, and they, you know, might be able to roll it out by 2028. And I remember I stood up and, I, you know, I said, wait a minute, I mean, you guys are theorizing about the perfect system. Meanwhile, you know, Carl Rove is probably sticking pushpins into a map someplace, trying to figure out where the current vulnerabilities are and what to do about them. So, you know, there's that disconnect between sort of the academic approach to all this, the long-term engineering approach, and the fact that we basically, uh, we have a crisis. What about the money, though? If there was more money, would it make a difference? Could it make a difference? You know, money should not be it. But it's not easy. It, it takes, it's labor intensive and it's capital intensive to uh, set up a really, really solid, trustworthy electoral system to, as Lynn says, every place along that pipe uh, that the votes go through, you know, she sees a link chain, I see it as a pipe. If you have duct tape around that clear pipe at any point along the way, that's where the person committing the fraud or wanting to influence the election is going to target. Um, so to get that pipe to be completely clear end to end um, is a major challenge. And this is a, this is a, this is a heavy lift. But on the other scale of the balance is what's at stake. And I mean, there probably is no higher stakes game, and it is a game in a way, uh, you can view it that way, in the world than US federal national elections, you know, biennial elections, state level, national level, county level, whatever. Um, so, you know, when you think about what we poured into just Iraq and Afghanistan alone, I mean, trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars to promote democracy around the world. And election administrators can't get, you know, a couple of hundred thousand bucks um, to get a bit to have a better audit. So we want our democracy to be the best in the world, but we want it on the cheap. 
And that's a fundamental collision. We're going to have to put in the effort and spend the money. It's not all that much. We're not the only country in the world, Lynn, doing elections. And there are other countries that do them and, and don't have some of the problems that we're talking about here. We're talking, I'm talking about other Western nations that, that do democracy reasonably well. What, if anything, can we learn from that? And what are they doing differently? Yes. Yeah, so, so one of the things I think that, that other countries do is, um, I think it kind of just goes back to common sense, right? So when there was all this talk about hacking of machines, there were some countries that decided to just abandon those machines altogether. And, you know, like I had said before, filling out your ballot and counting your ballot are two separate processes, but elections officials love to conflate those two. And they say, well, we have to have this because we can't possibly count these ballots by hand. But, you know, one thing that we could do in this country is what other countries do is they fill out their ballot using a hand marked paper ballot because when somebody does that very direct method of voting, that gives them a lot of confidence. Um, when you're voting on, when you're going to cast your vote on a, a piece of electronic equipment, that that leaves an unsettled feeling. I'll give you an example. I we moved to California for a short time, and I went to go vote. And you know, I'm. It, first of all, it's it's a little unnerving approaching a piece of equipment that you've never used before, you've never interacted with before, and and you feel a little nervous, right? Because there's people in line, and you don't want to hold up the line. And so already you're making people anxious about this process, what, rather than just doing a pen and and a ballot. And then at the end, you know, I'm pushing a button, and it says to vote. And then. <laughs> I start looking all under the machine. I start looking around and this uh, one of the poll workers comes up to me and she said, well, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I was looking to where my ballot was going to come out. And she said, oh, no, you just voted. And I kind of went, well, did I? You know, like it was just it was so unsettling. And I think, you know, to to force people to vote on machines where what comes out are a bunch of barcodes that they can't read and they're being expected to. Um, to verify that, yes, there is a uh, human readable print on that, that ballot card that comes out. But when you put that into the tabulator, all it's, all it's tabulating are those barcodes. So it doesn't meet that federal standard of, of a voter being able to verify their vote. And you know, people who are proponents of using barcodes, um, it's really the most unnecessary. I think actually who, what, why, um, Somebody wrote an article uh, saying it's the most unnecessary part of uh, of voting are these barcodes. And so, you know, I can't verify that barcode. So it doesn't even meet that basic requirement. And so rather than uh, states and jurisdictions choosing equipment that would give people more confidence, a system that was mostly handmarked paper ballots with ballot marking assistive devices for people who need them, um, and there are systems out there where those ballots, there's no difference between what one person's ballot that has a barcode or another person's ballot that, you know, that they filled out by hand. There are systems that meet that requirement. And, and what I don't understand is in this country, this, would, this wouldn't fly in other countries. They have a set of standards. And if the machine doesn't meet that standards, they get rid of the machine. And in this country, at least in North Carolina, 96 counties chose a system that can't be verified. Jonathan, you can respond to this in terms of machines. Even hand-marked paper ballots have to go through an optical scanning process. Yeah, and, and that always brings up the issue of whether you know hand-marked paper ballots are enough or if we have to do a hand count. And this is where the U.S. really departs from some of these other countries in terms of the level of challenge involved, uh, because most of them, I mean, Lynn was mentioning that some of them switched, Norway, Ireland, uh, the Netherlands, uh, they, you know, they went back to um, hand counting, uh, but they have parliamentary systems. So often you're in most elections, certainly in most national elections, you're counting a single contest. And here, you know, as we know, a lot of ballots can have, you know, 10, 20, 40 contests on them. So More in it, California, it, yeah, California, <laughs> welcome to California. It's, it, it's a it's a it's a it's a different level of challenge. But I think, you know, I mean, where, who, why, the question why that Lynn asked really is 
is is very much worth asking and pursuing to a satisfactory answer and that is why why do we want to replace and i'm talking about for able voters which is the vast majority of voters i mean the, the disability community has has obviously a, a stake in this and they need to have uh assistance and but what what happened was that was that was leveraged that the the rare exception was leveraged and and before you knew it we had dres you know touch screens and then we had ballot marking devices uh basically for for all all voters um and you know the question is why do you want to replace a, a, a precinct let's say where people come in they get handed a ballot there are 50 booths they go to their little booth they 50 people voting at once mark their ballot go over to a scanner drop it in go home five minutes with maybe two or three ballot marking devices where you have to stand online for two hours um, where they are notorious for freezing and breaking down and having to be patched and reprogrammed and stuff. Question is why? So is it really just a financial thing where they, uh, and by financial, I mean that they're vested interest in the vendors and they they put this forward because they have a great interest in selling brand new computers, the way Apple has an interest in selling brand new iPhones. And is that enough to explain it? Because you know, when you look at the stop the steal movement and you look at the the unrest among at this point mostly you know MAGA people, you know they want us. A lot of them want to see hand counted paper ballots. They don't trust these machines. But if you look at the Republican and even to some extent the Democratic, but primarily the Republican poobahs, the brain trust, they have done everything in their power, including filibustering legislation at the federal level and basically blocking it to make sure we keep these machines in service. It's it's the computerized goose that's laying golden eggs. To Lynn's point, though, these machines exist in red states and blue states. Lynn was talking about California. It doesn't get bluer than California as a state, but the same kind of problematic machines, the same as they are in red states and purple states. So it's not something that's just limited to one particular party or the other. These machines are spread across blue, red, and purple. Yes, but yes. but on the federal level, there have been legislative initiatives to mandate certain standards uh, for these machines and stop them from doing certain things like, you know, um, not generating paper or generating QR codes that can't be, I mean, it gets a little bit technical, but that are more difficult to verify. Audit, mandatory audit standards um, that have been blocked. And that that has been partisan. It's been blocked by the Republicans. And that's where I say, you know, you got to ask why. I mean, what's in it? What is in it for one side or another in doing some of this stuff? Some of it is just go with the flow. You know, we're in a computerized age. There's a certain amount of technological ignorance on, on the part of uh, most elected officials through no fault of their own. I mean, this stuff is, you know, it's specialized stuff. So it's easy to be persuaded to go along. But at a decision-making level, there seems to be um, a, 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 the, the efforts to bring this system into a higher state of ver verifiability were proposed in Congress, several sessions by Democrats, blocked by Republicans. And you got to, you, one question that has to be asked that the media really has, has fallen on its face and not asking is why. So, so, you know, I have a little bit of a different, um, I don't know, I guess I'm viewing it a little bit differently. I'm seeing it a little bit differently where like we were talking about scanning these ballots and, and what happens to those. Well, you know, after those ballots are scanned, it's not an optical scan anymore. It's a digital scanner. And so this ballot image is created and then this ballot image, um, then a cast vote record is uh, created. And so, and then, and then you have sort of the Castro record database. And so some places are actually destroying those records. They're destroying the ballot images and they're destroying the Castro records. And so you've got the ballot, they're destroying the ballot image, they're destroying the Castro record. And then here's a spreadsheet that's populated with all the, the vote totals and how each ballot was voted. And so, you know, there, there are groups that are trying to fight and make these, uh, a make people make make jurisdictions save these records because those are federal records and by law they have to be saved for 22 months following an election. Um, but 
there's legislation some some states actually do save these and so there are some groups that are wanting to um take these and take these records or have these records be released publicly so that that everyone can verify these records and so what ended up happening in in several states is that um you know audit usa they went and they tried to get legislation to make these public record and so the director went and he got a bunch of republicans to get on board in one state and he went to the democrats and they said oh yeah no the republicans are voting for that we can't vote for that there must be something you know there must be some some nefarious thing right. and so he so he, john brakey was very smart and he said you know what i'm going to go to arizona that's his home state and he said i'm going to approach the democrats first <laughs> so you know he's trying to approach the democrats first well he's got democrats on board oh in florida he's getting democrats on board and then then the democrats are on board and then there goes to the republicans the republicans say nope uh the Democrats are on board. I'm. We can't vote for that. And so, you know, I see it less as a, you know, Republican versus Democrat thing, Democratic thing, because it's different in different states. And yes, some states are blue and some states are red. But the local politics in that state um, can be pretty complicated, I guess. And so. I don't think I would put it all on one or the other. I think I'd kind of go back to what Jeff was saying, you know, when he was quoting Reagan and saying, trust but verify. You know, I think we're at that point almost. It does feel to me like these two sides are so skeptical of one another and so suspicious of one another that the really the only way to to bridge that is to do the trust but verify and you know one of the things i was looking up uh, a couple of weeks ago was was this term trust but verify and you know what i i wanted to know what did that mean to them and they came up with a bunch of procedures and processes that they could verify to me it just seems so um on par with how dangerous that time period was for us as a country and how dangerous this time period is for us. And I think the solution, though, is the same. As, as somebody that comes to this with an engineering background, is the solution not going backwards to more paper, but is the solution going forward with maybe another leap of technology that solves some of these problems? No, absolutely not. Um, so, you know, really the smartest way forward is through through handmark paper ballots it's through a through a, a system that is an analog system when you design a system you want redundancy you want you know there are all these requirements that you want and with electronic machines there's always hackers who are going to stay one step ahead and who can who can hack into that and so you know i know it seems strange for somebody who has an an aerospace engineering degree who loves technology who loves you know new new technologies but that technology doesn't belong everywhere. And the reason it doesn't belong everywhere is because one of the very fundamental things that I think people miss is that in order to have a successful election, the electorate has to believe in the results and specifically the person who lost and the people who supported that, they have to believe in the results. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to believe the results in a system that they themselves don't understand. Everyone understands a piece of paper and a pencil, but not everyone understands computers. And, and quite frankly, I don't even understand these computers, these systems. And I've spent years uh, reading the manuals and, and there's just so little that's given to the public to verify. You know, so that's sort of what, what where I'm working in North Carolina, um, we're getting volunteers to actually verify some of this information because evidence-based elections are really the solution. I, I don't think that we're past the point of there being a solution because I've worked with I work I work with a lot of people. Like I, even though we're nonpartisan, transparent elections is nonpartisan. I do work with some groups where there are people who don't believe that Trump lost, um, but the solution is the same. We all want the same thing. We want the elections officials to give us enough of that information, that data, 
so that we can be assured that every link in that chain was secure. Um, and so that's something that we're really running into in North Carolina. Um, and we're and actually this is we're seeing this in New York, we're seeing this in Florida, we're seeing this in Arizona, where you know it, our, us advocates who have been at this for much longer than just a few years, you know, we're asking for the same documents, we're asking for the same uh, observation opportunities, and those opportunities are actually being taken away from us because elections officials, I think, are feeling threatened. Um, by people just asking for documents. They're taking this very personally. And you know, the way that we view it is, look, we're just asking for some boring documentation that we just wanna verify and check. Why are we putting emotion into this? And you know, I understand that there are people who are threatening elections officials and elections officials do have a legitimate, um, a legitimate gripe and absolutely they should not be threatened or harassed but they're lumping people like me and Jonathan and other advocates into that same group of people who, you know, marched up the Capitol steps and those, and, and to lump us together really, um, it doesn't benefit them because we're sort of that bridge actually, <laughs> we're, we're that bridge um, between the elections officials and the people who actually don't trust our elections. You know, we can say to them, well, what don't you trust about it? And what would you like to see? If you saw this, would you trust the system? People continue to say the same thing. They want transparency. They want, when they go to their elections officials and say, hey, can we have this, can we have these documents that we've been asking for, honestly, for every election cycle? You don't call these predatory records requests and sort of make us out to be villains because we're being um, citizens. And so, you know, I, I really think that elections officials need to understand that people don't, it's not that people don't trust them. It's that people don't trust the process. They don't trust the electronic voting systems. And unless these elections officials show that what the process is, give the process manuals to people, let them see the process, bring them in, let them actually see it, let them ask questions. You know, I'd much rather have somebody go to one of these uh, meetings where we're opening ballots and scanning ballots, you know, absentee ballots, I would much rather have people walk into that meeting having read the manual of what's supposed to happen because then when they see something, they'll understand that, yes, they're supposed to be opening ballots right now because what you don't want is somebody to walk in have been told, no, we're not going to give you the process manual. They walk into that meeting and they see people opening ballots and they start, oh, they're opening ballots and they shouldn't, okay, that should never happen. Elections officials need to understand that we deserve to understand the process and we need, to, we deserve to understand the system. And elections officials, quite frankly, they don't understand these electronic voting systems. Jonathan, is that the answer? Better voting through better process? Boy, a lot to chew on there. First of all, I, 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 when it comes to trust but verify, I mean, I, I'm in violent nuclear agreement with with Lynn um, that this is this is the the solution that we've been aiming for from the very beginning. Uh, and I certainly didn't mean to absolve the Democrats. I was talking about you know legislation at the federal level. There's a lot of stuff that goes on at state and county level and all these fiefdoms uh, that is is pretty resistant. To, to public scrutiny uh, on the part of both parties. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, they don't, they by no means get off scot-free. Um, I think what, what we're seeing, and the ironies are so thick, um, it's very, very difficult really to sort through. Um, and, it, and it actually calls for a, a certain kind of journalism that really isn't out there um, very much, sorting through some of these ironies. And that is that, you know, the stop the stealers and election deniers are pointing to some very real flaws and vulnerabilities with this system. When you come out at, at it from the standpoint of whether it's January 6th or, you know, any other uh, form of, of, this, of this election denial and basically, you know, want to take the shortcut, you know, haven't produced um, even prima facie evidence and 
let's be clear, it's not easy to get your hands on the kind of evidence you need. So again, they have a point, you know, how are we going to produce evidence when everything is secret? But, you know, for the past 20 years, I've been working in this field and actually producing some evidence, statistical patterns, anomalies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you got to do the work. Instead, it's been this sort of teleological view that, you know, Donald Trump won. And because the election system didn't uh, didn't confirm that victory, uh, his 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 victory or landslide or whatever it was supposed to be, um, it's corrupt. And therefore, you know, any form of attack, whether it's on election officials, uh, threats or 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 just, you know, the, the various kind of uh, the the overblown allegations, um, audits like quote unquote audits like was done in Arizona. Um, you know, these are these are really in and of themselves held to very low standards. And we're asking to hold the system to a high standard, but the assault on the system is anything goes. And that's where it gets really dicey. And this is where, you know, some organization like Who What Why really has an opportunity to say, look, we have a both and problem here. Uh, we have very irresponsible attacks on democracy, and yet at the same time, we have a, a process which is fundamentally indefensible. And therefore, it's drawing, it's, it's spurring these kind of pot shot attacks, which are very dangerous. Um, you know, I'm going to tease, we're, we're working on a democracy scorecard that goes state by state and looks at all these various aspects of democracy. And I will say, you know, it does have a bit of a partisan uh, outcome to it. But the bottom line is that the vast majority of states did not do well. Uh, more than half of them outright failed, you know, got a D but, or an F. But on the two, two separate issues, talking about making it easier or more difficult for people to vote, which is one set of issues, and the results once they do vote, which is the other part of it. Yeah, I mean, they're both components of the, of the ultimate outcome. I and mean, we long ago coined the phrase strip and flip. I mean, you strip the electorate down um, by, by disenfranchising the people you don't want to vote. And then if that, you know, when that's not sufficient um, to, uh, to get the outcome you, you desire, then you flip votes as needed in, you know, in, the, in, the, in the pitch dark of cyberspace. So I think we're, we're looking at an electoral system that it, right now we're in political total war. That's part of the problem, that we're in a place where it, it's really no holds barred. Come out, not only come out ahead, uh, but come out ahead in a way that it, it almost becomes irrevocable. And we've seen that in other countries. We've seen what happens when it becomes a managed democracy. And we're, we're, that is a real looming danger. But, but isn't there a danger also in conflating all of these issues? Doesn't it become too much talking about the ability to people to get out to vote, the machines, the, the counting of the ballots, all of the other things you're talking about, the Electoral College, the independent legislature issue, all of these things, when they get conflated, makes it too much for anybody to pay attention to any of it. Well, so so some of the things actually, um, I, I think you're right in some sense that that you know you can you can use some of this stuff to conflate issues to to make a point like right so the voting vendors will conflate things like casting your ballot versus filling out your ballot but it is tied because a lot of these uh ballot marking devices are actually being weaponized where you know okay you do some calculation there's a 12 hour voting day say everyone spends 6 minutes you know per per i think we probably spend more than that but really what you're talking is maybe 120 people per day can vote on that one machine and so when you have a jurisdiction where you've got 5000 people coming through the door well say i'm a say i'm a jurisdiction where i want to see lo longer lines in some places well i'm going to put fewer voting machines in those places and so, you know, these these systems that are being used, you know, I think if people just used a little bit of common sense, you know, with these 
I'm going to just keep going back to the ballot marking devices because I just think they're such a big a big issue to use them the way that they're being used. But if you even just did a pros and cons list, right? You're 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 using a less secure system. It's costing more money. It's creating more skepticism. Why are we using it? And I think it goes back to the who part of it, right? That's the why. The who is who does this benefit? Right? When you design a system, you keep the user in mind. And you know, the, these systems don't have the user in mind. They don't have the voter in mind. They don't have the election official in mind. Um, you know, one of these vendors was meeting with an election official and he and he's a, um, a computer scientist and he said, you know, why, why, why does your system allow us to make this mistake that's, that's, that's co common enough to make and easy enough to make? And they said, well, we just designed the system and it's up to you guys to figure out how to use it. Well, that's not really responsible. And I want to address the idea of conflation because I, I agree, you're right. I mean, it, it becomes overwhelming and there's an absolute threat that people will throw up their hands and just say, I don't want to deal with this. Uh, it's too much on my plate. Uh, and maybe even to the point where I'm not going to vote. I mean, you've demonstrated to my satisfaction that the whole system is is a is a mess and so why should I you know bother especially if I'm a working person and I have to make sacrifices to vote and especially if I'm going to a place where they've reduced the number of ballot boxes or reduced the number of uh, ballot marking devices so I have to stand online so you know there is that danger but the thing is Jeff I mean, elections are ultimately they're 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 very soulless. They're about numbers. At the end of the day, there's you know a winner's number and a loser's number, and that's it. And it really doesn't matter how you get to that number. So if you're you know a political force that is trying to figure out how to hold power, I mean, you could you could stage a military coup. There are a lot of things you could do to hold power. But if you're going to do it through elections. Your bottom line is your number has got to be bigger than their number in enough places. And if you're looking at how you work this system to win, it could be keeping people from the polls, reducing the number of ballot boxes, limiting vote by mail. Right. But isn't there a fundamental difference between how one works the system within the legal framework of that system, such as it is, and the actual counting of the votes and, and the honesty of that count and within the legal framework of that. There, there seems to me there are two entirely different things. One is working a system that is just the legal system that we have, whether it's gerrymandering, whether it's how you get people to the polls, yeah. whether it's encouraging or discouraging vote by mail in certain communities. All those things are, are legal ways to work the system. Manipulating votes and fraudulent vote counts are a whole different animal. Right. And you would think there would be a bright ethical line between them. And that's one of the cases that I began making long ago is that uh, we can't count on that kind of bright ethical line um, in all the actors who are involved in this process. I mean, we've heard from sort of, you know, former um, operative, somebody like Tim Miller, who you, who you interviewed, about what goes on, you know, what when you get into that, we're here to win mentality, you don't draw these nice distinctions about what's within the legal system and what is just, you know, people cheat at poker. I mean, you know, you can play a good game of poker and you could also palm an ace. Um, it's harder to cheat at a game like chess, for instance. It's hard to move twice. But if your opponent left the room and went off someplace and you move twice and you won your, your chess game that way, you know, where is that ethical line? And I think in the mind of, especially once it becomes total war and your mentality is, look, we are entitled, we, we should be in charge here. We should rule this, this state or we should rule this country. It's, it's sort of divine whatever it is, you know, benediction, um, there, it, the, the things that you're talking about, you know, they are different. One is working the system kind of its soft points and its flexibilities. And the other is really going kind of deep into a very dark and dangerous place. And for the longest time in this country, we, people have said, nah, 
It'll never happen here. That's what changed what stopped the steal. All of a sudden, you had tens of millions of people, uh, people that are on the other side of the partisan divide from, from where I am. But they began saying, whoa, wait a minute. It, it could happen here. It could happen here. Wow. I bet you it did happen here. And so we're in a different environment now. And I don't think you can really separate those things in the sense, pragmatically, you can separate them. But from an ethical standpoint, if you're going to manipulate the system, I think you go for where, wherever the vulnerabilities are. There are plenty of vulnerabilities when it comes to disenfranchisement, plenty of vulnerabilities when it comes to disinformation. And we believe there are vulnerabilities when it comes to uh, the vote counting process itself. Lynn, we'll talk a little bit about that, that line that I was talking about before. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of, and I, I'll call them um, skeptics groups, <laughs> that they, they're, they're election skeptics. And there are a lot of those groups. And I think the thing that I would caution the media against, and I would caution election officials against, is to ignore, ign to ignore them. You know, they, they do have some good points, right? On one hand, they're saying our election system needs reform. And on the other hand, they're saying, uh, we believe this guy won and, and we're gonna do whatever we can to prove that. Well, I started reaching across and talking to those groups uh, because I wanted them to understand what they were saying. Some of it was true and some of it was complete, uh, complete fabrication from people who wanted to cause chaos. And so, you know, I think it's very dangerous for us to just ignore them. And so one of the things that, um, one of the things that we have been trying to do in multiple places is to get people to say, okay, you think that Trump won, you understand that there's no legal mechanism to go backwards. And the only thing we can do is move forward together. And to say to them, look, we've been studying this, these elections for years. We're asking for ballot images. We're asking for poll tapes, um, which is essentially a, um, a poll tape is a receipt that comes out of a tabulator that has vote totals on it. And, and so we're asking them to come along with us and say, look, you know, you could spend your time screaming that Trump won, or you could spend your time helping us go image poll tapes. And then that might compel them to actually uh, change some things. I'm seeing that elections officials, at least in North Carolina, are really digging in when you go to them to say, hey, this process is broken. Or even in North Carolina, back for the 2020 primary, I went to them and said, the process that the two largest counties and many other counties are using to count our ballots, to, to process our absentee ballots, is actually illegal. And you guys need to stop doing this because the stop the steal people, they know you're doing it. <laughs> and they're gonna challenge all those ballots. And so it took me five months and um, getting fired uh, as a political observer because my political party didn't like that I went public with it eventually. But the elections officials didn't want actually to change something that was broken. And that to me is really troubling um, that I am seeing that in North Carolina and I'm seeing that in some other jurisdictions. You know, in New York, Lulu Freistadt, she is from Smart Elections and she also found discrepancies in poll tapes and they removed her observing credentials, right? I disclosed that these jurisdictions were processing absentee ballots illegally so that they would start processing them legally by the time the general election came around. And that did happen and I was successful at that. But since then, I've been harassed, I've been targeted. Um, you know, I mean, there's a whole, a whole story there, a saga of how I've been getting all this backlash because, um, you know, I'm going and saying, hey, there's this issue, please fix it. I'm seeing smoke coming out of this theater. <clears throat> and most media, they don't really quite know what to do with people like us who are really, our motivation is not to overturn an election. Our motivation is to prevent future fraud, to shut down any avenues people have to you know, have insider fraud with, you know, to commit insider fraud. And so we're really preventing uh, election fraud for future elections. And 
and that's not getting covered. What's getting covered is, um, you know, people people talking about, you know, elections officials talking about how they're so overwhelmed with all these records requests, right? So I met with a bunch of groups and, and they said, well, what can we do? We want to do something. We want to see some evidence. And I said, well, look, we've been, we've been collecting these poll tapes and analyzing them. Why don't I teach you how to do this? <clears throat> and so I've been teaching people how to do this. But then when we find some discrepancies and we go to elections officials, um, they're not what I, what I would expect for somebody who really wants to improve the system is for them to go, oh gosh, why is why does that poll tape look that way? Yeah, let's let's open an investigation. And what you end up having is um, them just removing our observing credentials. So th that is a really dangerous trend, and I think a lot of the media is fueling that. You know, the media says, oh, stop the steal. They're don't don't tell them anything's wrong with our elections because it'll give them fuel for the fire. But it seems to me like the media is sort of pitting um, elections officials against meaningful, you know, well-meaning members of the public who want to do meaningful uh, observation. And I, I don't see it as I, I'm not seeing what the media is reporting. I'm seeing that I'm meeting with groups on the left who, yes, they're pointing the finger and saying we were cheated, you know, we may have been cheated in some previous election and I'm working with groups on the right right that think they were cheated in a different election and but they both agree what the solution is the solution is transparency the solution is um, more robust audits but when you go to elections officials with that they don't want that right for some reason they don't want that and i'm not sure i'm not i i don't understand why they're so resistant to it jonathan what why do you think they're resistant to it we're just about out of time why do you think they're so opposed to it especially in a situation like lynn's talking about where there seems to be support on both sides for for making some of these reforms well first i, I want to give a you know shout out to lynn who's here and to her colleagues who are not here for what they're doing, for being in the trenches. It really, you know, we're in very, we have very different sort of seats at this play. Um, and, you know, you, you're really banging your nose against the, against the spiked wall there. Um, and we need that and we need more of that. Uh, and we need more responsible people doing that um, so that that becomes the, the narrative. So, I mean, just tremendously appreciative. And then also the role for, journalism more sitting back and looking at it all um and trying to get at the truth of what is going on and in you know response to your question i don't i don't know i've never been an administrator in that in that regard so i'm not exactly sure what uh, you know goes goes through their heads but my sense is uh from the bit of contact i've had with sort of closed systems um is that they are kind of like fiefdoms, whether they're hiding deep, dark secrets and things that they're, you know, letting slide with the vendors or things that have, you know, conflicts of interest, as Lynn says, in the testing process. Now, that may also be there in, in, in cases. I mean, my, my sense is that the vast majority uh, of election administrators and certainly election workers are really devoting themselves. They're not getting a lot of, you know, pay out of this. This is not the corporate world. And they are devoting themselves to try to run elections, um, but their main goal uh, and, and run elections fairly. But their main goal is usually to run, an, you know, they call it a good night when there's no controversy. So there's a kind of allergy uh, to this kind of probing and controversy, um, which, again, comes up because the system itself um, is, is sort of set up to to for concealment. It's basically designed for concealment. And these are worker bees uh, in a system that's designed for concealment. Uh, but they do, you know, they are human and they take it kind of personally when people come snooping and probing and demanding this and demanding that. It's not an easy thing to adjudicate. In fact, very often it winds up in the courts uh, and you wind up with, you know, with actual judges doing the adjudication of what you're entitled to. And finally, what do we think happens with the counting process in the midterm elections this year and looking towards 2024? What are, what are the flashpoints that you see right now? Jonathan, we'll start with you. A lot of predictions are made about elections. We've seen in the past 
uh, that those predictions don't necessarily pan out. Um, we've thought that in some cases that's not because the polling was off again, which is generally the uh, you know the, the conventional wisdom. We think that in some cases uh, elections were manipulated. Uh, but one way or another, it's very hard to tell based on um, you know based on based on the polls. How much is polling a fundamental part of the problem? Oh well, you know if you go back, I, I started my career as as a, as a political pollster, an analyst uh, in a, in a polling firm in in D.C. And right at the get go, I came up. You know, it struck me that polling was probably uh, the, the, the footstep of doom for our democracy, because in a very general sense, it sets up a, a very unhealthy feedback loop in which politicians can find out what the public is thinking and cater to it, um, at, you know, at, at least in the run up to elections. So I think polling, it's a, it's a very, very double edged sword. But in terms of, um, you know, in a very general sense, in terms of what it's what it's doing now, you know, it's being there are a lot of problems uh, with polling, both exit polling, especially when you have a lot of uh, uh, non uh, election day voting and early voting and mail in voting and whatnot uh, becomes very more difficult. You know, it's a tricky thing. Uh, the pollsters work pretty hard to get it right. Is part of the problem that polling in, in, for all of its good and bad quality sets up a set of expectations? that combined with the lack of trust in the system that we've been talking about makes everything worse than it might ordinarily be. That's a possibility. But if you look at, for instance, the 2020 election, polling set up expectations that Trump would lose by 13 million votes. And he wound up losing by 7 million votes and his backers still went crazy. So I don't really think, you, you know, you can you can put it on the, on the polls, both the pre-election polls and the exit polls in that election had Biden winning by between 12 and 13 million votes nationwide. And that that uh, was cut in half. Um, so I don't think that's the issue. And I don't think we want to do away with polling because then you're completely blind unless we went to a system that was truly public and observable and, and, and verified. Um, but as it stands, this is one of the very few windows we have to even begin to assess whether an election was on uh, the level. And of course, it's a system that the U.S. has been using in countries around the world for decades um, to assess whether elections have been honest. Uh, they've been using exit polls and they they it has often result well enough times resulted in uh, electoral redos even. So I don't think that, I mean, I think that's shoot, you know, sort of shooting the, the, the wrong culprit. I don't know what's going to happen in 2022, you know, go back to your original question, much less in 2024, but we are definitely skating on the edge of a, of a cliff here uh, because we've seen that it, it can break down in a hurry uh, and the ingredients are in place. Uh, for it to break down again, I think we'll be very lucky if we come through this, uh, you know, with a with a functioning democracy. And finally, Lynn, how do you see that exactly what Jonathan says playing out on the ground in some place like North Carolina? Yeah, North Carolina is quite, <laughs> quite a quite divisive. Um, it's quite divisive here. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't know much about polling. Um, but, you know, when Jonathan was talking, I kept thinking, well, yeah, this, that's a tool. I mean, it's a tool that other countries do use to decide, oh, was this election actually legitimate? And some elections have been, like Jonathan said, you know, redone because of that. And so any tools can really be used for good or for bad, right? And so I think that's kind of how I see things going is that, we have tools that we can use um, to get through this. And I initially thought when I decided to devote uh, as long as it took to getting our elections um, to be trustworthy, that I, I actually thought it was gonna just be, okay, just make these incremental changes every election season. And I just am not sure that we have that much time left. And so I think everyone <laughs> needs to use the tools that they have and and really pitch in to make sure that you know that we are we are debunking disinformation whether it comes from 
uh, people on the right or will it, whether it comes from election vendors or election officials. I think the media needs to use their tools to make sure to call out the elections officials when they are spreading uh, disinformation and call out the vendors when they're spreading disinformation. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that this new interest in elections and people understanding elections will ultimately make elections more trustworthy because there'll be more people paying attention and understanding how the process works. Um, I'm concerned that uh, some people aren't uh, thinking it, about it in a rational way. And there are people who have sort of, um, for better or worse, you know, for, for, I guess, lack of a better word, they've sort of joined a cult where they, where they wholeheartedly believe in one thing, um, even though they haven't actually seen um, any real evidence that would that would point to that. Um, and so I think we're at a really scary time in our democracy, especially when well-meaning people of the public are asking questions and they're being banned. Like in my jurisdiction, they've banned me so that I can't go to public meetings anymore and I'm not allowed to vote in person in my own county right now. Lynn Bernstein, Jonathan Simon. I thank you both so much. Thanks for having me.